The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Something fishy is going on at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Look past the gyrating jellies and the swaying kelp, and you'll find visitors savoring fare like beer-battered fish and chips and lobster sandwiches. But the restaurant isn't the only place where the staff caters to picky palates. I'm preparing the diets for our sea otters we have here at the aquarium. They have to eat quite a bit to keep up their body temperature to live in the cold water. They're also pretty picky, so they kind of decide what they're going to eat that day and what they aren't. But they love shrimp, and they love their clam, and they also like to eat a little bit of squid. Since 1998, Casey Kuramura has helped prepare more than 200 pounds of food a day for 400 different species of animals at the aquarium. Working in this kind of kitchen presents unique challenges. Working here as an animal chef is quite a bit different than working as a human chef I did in college and high school. The diets are so irregular from humans, and some of the animals don't have to eat every day as opposed to humans, we always eat every day. And for her non-human diners, the ingredients are often as unusual as the eating habits. Take krill, a tiny shrimp that's great for blending. A krill shake is basically composed of small krill, flake food, and seawater. Yum. That sounds delicious if you're an anemone. So mainly our anemones are the biggest ones that get the, the krill shake. Since our water comes in filter, we lose a lot of nutrients that, that they would naturally filter feeds. So we have to make up for those by making these krill shakes for them. And if you're a growing 300-plus pound ocean sunfish, a gel diet encased in sausage skin does the body good? It basically is a fake fish product as opposed to using real fish, but this fake fish product is great because it's got lots of nutrients and lots of extra vitamins we can give to our fish, kind of like eating a power bar. Human, fish, or bird, we all need our vitamins, but some of us need to be tricked into taking them. Here, a fish's gills are a good hiding place. When it's available, staff members feed the animals sustainably caught seafood, just like in the human restaurant. And like that menu, the menu here is seasonal and subject to change. Frequently in aquariums, diets are based on our attempts as caregivers to mimic what we know these animals eat in the wild. So you try and come up with as close a diet given what is available in the marketplace to feed these animals. But the biggest problem is trying to figure out what that balanced diet consists of. What we find is that maybe a diet source that we start with may not be appropriate for a long term and we have to, may have to modify it. It's a challenge from any angle, and the sheer number and diversity of mouths to feed provides plenty of learning opportunities. Like, let's say you're not the only big fish in a big pond, or rather tank. At feeding time, how can you make sure you get your fair share? You can't really chase them down and expect them to feed, so if we can train them, make them very comfortable coming to a particular target, a particular location. We can hand feed them so we have control over what they eat, how much they eat, when they eat. So using conditioning is a very important tool for us. Got teeny, teeny brains, but they have a strong motivation for food. Back on land, Casey helps with feeding 17 African black-footed penguins. They're a hungry lot, eating 20 pounds a day. Susu got a fish. Durbin got a fish. Their names are called out as they eat, allowing the staff to keep track of who's not eating their breakfast. But most of the penguins come back for seconds, thirds, fourths. Boulders got a W. Boulders got a W. Boulders got a W. But just keeping an eye on who's eating what obviously isn't enough. 
Animals at aquariums and zoos across the country are also routinely weighed to monitor the impact of diets on their health. He's 3.69 kilos. At the San Francisco Zoo, veterinarian Jacqueline Jensek explains that more invasive exams are sometimes needed as well. There definitely are some disease processes out there that we can say are linked nutritionally. And um, we have a, a condition called iron storage disease. What happens is the lemur's body starts to build up too much iron, and that goes to the liver and then starts to cause damage to the liver over a long period of time. The disease is linked to fruits high in vitamin C. It's common among lemurs, a type of primate from Madagascar. However, once found, it's easily treated. We're actually drawing a small amount of blood out once a week to create almost a very mild anemia. And what the body then does is it pulls the iron that's being stored in the liver out to the bone marrow to create more red blood cells, because iron is a big part of a red blood cell. This is a um, treatment that we actually stole from human medicine. He'll be fine, and he'll make more for next week. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's the feeding, more feeding, and still more feeding of the zoo's furry and feathered diners. Breakfast is served. Providing healthy, varied meals at the San Francisco Zoo costs nearly $340,000 a year. And just to give you an example here, these are the diets that are going to make up um, all the diets that we feed the 800 different animals. You can see they're quite thick binders. Every species is very different as to their protein, their caloric requirements. Um, certainly a, a carnivore is meant to eat a lot more meat and protein than, say, a bird is. Certainly metabolism plays a factor in all of our, our diets that we have for the animals. A bird always has a much higher metabolism than a, than a mammal. A reptile has a lower metabolism than a mammal. And so that actually guides our feeding strategies. In addition to the paper trail of dietary records, the zoo now can evaluate an animal's nutrition and develop feeding strategies with a little high-tech zootrition. That software program basically allows us to compare our diets to other institutions, make sure that we're not missing anything, we're not overdoing any particular parts of the diet. But you still need zookeepers like Corey Hallman to observe how those diets are affecting the animals' well-being day by day. The biggest diet-related concern for the chimps is obesity. Um, these chimps are getting pretty old. Uh, we have had problems with weight issues, so we're monitoring that very closely. A peek into the zoo's pantry reveals off-the-shelf chows, ready-made for animals like primates, adult bearded dragons, and hoofed herbivores. I have actually tried this stuff. Um, it tastes very dry and like, like vitamins. <laughs> Not very good stuff. And then there are the treats, or enrichment items. The chimps can have peanuts every now and then. It's just a special treat or enrichment item. Do they like peanuts more than bananas? No, bananas are still their favorite. <laughs> These treats don't just taste good, they also get the animals thinking. We definitely use food here to stimulate their thought processes, to mimic natural behaviors. So you'll see, especially with the primates, the keepers go to great lengths to hide food throughout their habitat, so they spend the entire day foraging. We make them work for their food a little bit because that's part of the enjoyment. But given the variety of ingredients and special diets, the humans also get a workout. Just ask Eva Mack and Kathy Hobson, who prepare 40 to 50 bird diets a day. Delicious. It doesn't matter how much care has gone into the preparation. Some birds will still turn up their beaks. The pelicans won't eat it unless it's perfect. Penguins are very particular, so they won't take it if it's got rips. Some of the birds that are big fruit eaters don't like orange fruit. Sometimes we can get around that with presentation and get them used to a better variety of foods. And like any good chef knows, it helps to sample the ingredients beforehand. Um, I've actually tried most of the dry foods because, you know, if we're going to feed it to our animals, we have to make sure that it's the highest and best food, highest quality. So, I mean, if they can eat it, I can too. 
For me, there's nothing simple about uh, creating a diet for an animal. Animals are definitely very perceptive of their food, and so they you know, demand from us the best quality. It's a relationship with demands and rewards. Where humans serve, animals thrive. Where preferences are defined in the language of food. With every mouth-watering bite. That's your last mouth.